Hello and welcome to Reading the Gospels Together in our special Good Friday edition where we're going to be looking at a section of Matthew 27 covering both the crucifixion and death of Jesus. Be sure if you haven't already done so to view our Stations of the Cross video from 2019. The links are available on our website and our Facebook page as well. The crucifixion of Jesus begins in verse 32 of Matthew chapter 27. We read, as they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross. Have you ever thought about why they mentioned Simon by name and where he's from? It's because he was known to the Christian community and it identifies him as one of those early Christian leaders. The Gospel of Mark goes even further and indicates to us that Simon was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Again, two people who must have been known to Mark's community. Otherwise, why mention them by name? It's astonishing to think that Simon's time of carrying the cross with Jesus led him to follow the Messiah as well. The reading continues. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. Golgotha, meaning place of the skull, could indicate that this was either an established execution ground for the Romans, and so it was known as a place of death. It could also indicate that this is a place where tombs and graves are located, as we know they are. Uh, Jesus himself was entombed only a short distance away. It could also mean that there was a rock formation in the quarry area, the abandoned quarry, which resembled a skull. We read there they offered Jesus wine to drink mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Wine mixed with gall was a sedative of sorts, which Jesus rejected. When they crucified him, they divided up his lots, his clothes by casting lots. You wouldn't think there would be much value in that, but for the soldiers, I suppose, anything to pass the time. Above his head they placed the written charge against him, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The other Gospels mention that this sign was written in three languages, Latin, Greek, and Hebrew, so that all passers-by could read it. It was common practice to place above the, uh, the head of a condemned criminal who was being crucified the reason for that uh, punishment being given. In Jesus' case, it was because he had been declared to be the King of the Jews. Incidentally, in Latin, that is Jesus Nazareth Rex Judeus, or I-N-R-I. If you've seen on stained glass windows or communion tables, those letters I-N-R-I, they're recalling the sign that was placed above Jesus' head at the time of the crucifixion. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left. Rebels is probably a better term than thieves. We're used to the term thieves, but rebels is probably better. Also, crucifixion for thievery was not very common, but crucifixion for rebellion certainly was. It indicates in Matthew that neither of them had that very positive interaction we read of in the other Gospels, where there's a bad thief, but also a good thief. In Matthew, these rebels... Uh, both just insult Jesus. There are others who are insulting Jesus as well. We read, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, teachers of the law, and elders mocked him. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He's the King of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him, for he said, I am the Son of God. It's very interesting to compare these insults with the temptations to which Jesus was subjected in the desert. Turn back to those and you'll find a very, very close parallel between the nature of the temptations Satan subjected Jesus to and these final insults being hurled upon him. The story continues. From noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. There are some who think that this was the nature of an eclipse, others who think it was a meteorological event of darkening clouds gathering. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, 
Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Matthew translates this because it is first in Aramaic, which may not have been a familiar language to most who were reading the gospel, but certainly to Jesus it was. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Is not only a cry from Jesus' heart, but it's also a reference to Psalm 22. It is, in fact, the opening line of that psalm. What Jesus is doing is identifying very closely with that psalmist and with that psalm. You can find it in our daily reading today. Psalm 22 is an uncanny psalm which goes through the process that Jesus himself went through on this day of humiliation, crucifixion, and death. But it ends with the assurance that the psalmist is not abandoned by God. And we know that Jesus was not either. When Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit, we read. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The temple was that area which was expected to contain the presence of God, that God was in the Holy of Holies, which was separated from the rest of the temple by an enormous thick curtain. That curtain being torn in two meant that now the time of the temple was over and all of humanity had access to God, not only the high priest on the one day of atonement. Also, as referred to in one of our earlier studies, this curious phrase, the earth shook, the rock split, the tombs broke open, the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tomb after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Now, it's very curious. This passage indicates both the time of the death of Jesus when there was this earthquake, but it also says that those bodies came out of the tombs after Jesus' resurrection and went into the holy city. It seems as though this verse, this reference of this strange event is somewhat beyond time. Is it looking forward to the ultimate resurrection of people from the dead as a result of Jesus' resurrection? It's a mysterious verse. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all that had happened, they were terrified and exclaimed, Surely he was the Son of God. This is the climax of the Gospel of Matthew. With everything that has gone on before, the fulfillment of all the prophecies, the manner of Jesus' death, and in fact the earthquake which happened as a result, Matthew is telling us all in the words of the centurion, by now we should realize who Jesus is. Jesus is the Son of God. It indicates the women who were there who had stood at a distance and watched all this happen. And Matthew makes quite a point a bit later on that those women not only watched the crucifixion, but carefully watched the entombment of Jesus as well. Thankfully, Jesus had a follower, Joseph of Arimathea, described as a disciple and as a wealthy man who has sufficient clout or perhaps bribery to persuade Pilate to let him have the body and take care of it. And Pilate gives that permission, having received word that indeed Jesus has died on the cross. We read very simply, Joseph took the body, wrapped it in a clean linen cloth, and placed it in his own new tomb that he had cut out of the rock. He rolled a big stone in front of the entrance to the tomb and went away. Importantly, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb. There's no mistaking which tomb this is going to be. Matthew's careful to point out there are witnesses to where that tomb is, and the Marys are unlikely to forget where that is. We read in the other Gospels that the tomb itself was only a short distance away from the place of the crucifixion. A trip to the Church of the Holy Sepulchre today will reveal both the place of the crucifixion and the tomb, perhaps 75 meters or so apart. We read then that the next day, the one after the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days, I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he's been raised from the dead. This last deception will be worse than the first. 
Indeed, Pilate says, take a guard, go and make it secure. They went and made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and posting the guard. And so it is shut, it is watched, it is guarded. Jesus has died. The story seems to be over. Only a miracle could now change the story from something tragic and terrible to something wonderful. And as we know, that miracle is coming. It's Friday, but Sunday is coming. I hope you'll join me as well tomorrow for a special one-hour presentation on the footsteps of Jesus from the upper room to the cross. Barring technical difficulties, I hope to have this ready by noon tomorrow. Look for it on our website and our Facebook page as well. In the meantime, God bless you this Good Friday and through till Easter Sunday and the celebration which awaits.